Uh oh, guess what day it is? minutes out of your day to take your mind off things i'm doing my job right and that's all i want to do here okay so let's have some fun uh before i get started let's drop the pluggables you can follow the show on twitter at twwpod1 uh check me out on facebook at facebook.com slash talking whatever wednesday give me five stars on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts and if you have any comments or suggestions, email me at talkingwhateverwednesday at gmail.com. Now, whew, prison. Prisons in various forms have been part of society since before history, from the ancient Greeks and beyond, okay? And since people, since, you know, a lot of people that go to prison tend to not want to be there, inevitably, there's going to be people that try to escape from prison. And that's what this hashtag evergreen episode is all about. All right, let's get into it. In 1244, while in prison in the Tower of London, Tyrone Vane Yao, I'm probably butchering your name, dude, I'm sorry, crafted a makeshift rope, a makeshift rope made of bedsheets and cloths, lowered it, and climbed down. But because he was too heavy, the rope broke and he fell to his death was moved to a larger, lighter cell with a view, despite his protest that he was perfectly happy where he was, thoroughly fucking up his plan. <laughs> uh, he later wrote, I sat in my armchair like a man in a stupor, motionless as a statue. I saw that I had wasted all the efforts I had made, and I could not repent of them. I felt that I had nothing to hope for, and that, and the only relief left to me was to not think of the future. End quote. So sad. <laughs> Casanova then set upon another escape plan. He solicited the help of, a, of the prisoner in the adjacent cell, Father Balbi, a renegade priest. The spike was passed to the priest in a folio Bible carried under a heaving plate of pasta by the hoodwinked jailer. Good job. The priest made a hole in his ceiling, climbed across, and made a hole in the ceiling above Casanova's cell uh, to neutralize his new cellmate, who was a spy, apparently. Castanova played on his superstitions and terrorized him into silence. I'm not sure what his superstitions were or how Casanova terrorized him, but let's just go on. Uh, when Balbi broke through to Casanova's cell, Casanova lifted himself through the ceiling, leaving behind a, leaving behind a note that quoted the, seven, the 117th Psalm. I shall not die but live, and declare the works of the Lord. Oh. The spy remained too too afraid of the consequences if you were caught escaping with the others. Again, what the hell was he afraid of? I mean, besides, you know, the punishment of escaping, but... Alright, who am I? Casanova and Balbi pried their way through the lead plates and onto the sloping roof of Doge's, of the Doge's Palace. Casanova then pried open the, the grate over a dorm window and broke the window to gain entry. They found a long ladder on the roof and with the additional use of a bedsheet rope that Cas Casanova had prepared... Wait, another another bedsheet rope? Didn't he... Didn't, did, he not, did he not pay attention to earlier? All right. They then lowered themselves into the room whose floor was 20 feet, 25 feet below. They rested until morning, changed clothes, then broke a small lock on the exit door and passed into a palace corridor through galleries and chambers and downstairs where by convincing the guard they had inadvertently been locked in the palace after an official function, they left through the final door, escaping by gondola in the morning. Casanova eventually returned to Paris, 
later living in Venice, and would finally meet his end on June 4th, 1798, at the age of 73 in Ducks, Dukes, Bohemia. Good job for Casanova. This next one's a lot of fun. John Hunt Morgan was a Confederate general during the Civil War, so right off the bat, fuck him and everyone that looks like him. Morgan ran an operation that was known as Morgan's Raid, a diversionary incursion by Confederate cavalry into the Union states of Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia from June 11th to July 26th, 1863, in violation of direct orders given to him by his fellow piece-of-shit general Braxton Bragg. In July 1863, he set out on a thousand mile, or 1600 kilometer, if you're from other parts of the world, raid into Indiana and Ohio, taking hundreds of prisoners. On July 26, near Salineville, Ohio, Morgan and his exhausted, hungry, and saddle sore, saddle sore soldiers were finally forced to surrender. But after Union gunboats intercepted most of his men, Morgan surrendered at Salineville, following the Battle of Salineville. I wonder how they got that name. His point of surrender is the northernmost point ever reached by uniformed Confederates. Good for him, but still, fuck him. It was the farthest north. It was the farthest north that any uniformed Confederate troops would penetrate during the war. Thumbs up and thumbs down. On November 27th, Morgan and six of his officers, most notably Thomas Hines, escaped from their cells in the Ohio Penitentiary by digging a tunnel from Hines's cell into the inner yard and then ascending a wall with a rope made from bunk coverlets and a bent poker iron. Shortly after midnight, Morgan and, the th and three of his officers boarded a train from the nearby Columbus train station and arrived in Cincinnati whoop, that morning. Morgan and Hines jumped from the train before reaching the depot and escaped into, Kentu into Kentucky by hiring a skiff to take them across the Ohio River. Through the assistance of piece of shit sympathizers, they eventually made it safely into the South. Coincidentally, the same day he escaped, his wife gave birth to a daughter, who died shortly afterwards before Morgan returned home. That last part's kind of sad, but still, fuck him. On the night between January, February 9th and February 10th, 1864, over 109 Union POWs broke out of a building at Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia, in what became known as the Libby Prison Escape. Led by Colonel Thomas E. Rose of the 77th Pennsylvania Infantry, the prisoners were start, had started tunneling in a rat-infested zone, which the Confederate guards were reluctant to enter. Why? because Confederate soldiers are the 19th century version of Star Wars stormtroopers. That's why. The tunnel emerged in a vacant lot besides a warehouse, where the, the escapees could walk out through the gate without arising suspicion, because they didn't look like prisoners. Since the prison was believed to be escape-proof, there was less vigilance by the authorities than in other camps, and the alarm was not raised for nearly 12 hours. I refer back to my Star Wars stormtroopers analogy. Due to their familiar familiarity with the terrain, after serving in McClellan's Peninsula Campaign of 1862, 59 of the, of the 109 prisoners made it back to Union lines. Two were drowned in the nearby James River, and 48 were recaptured. All right, so 59 out of 109. That's pretty good odds, right? Right, right? Um, next one's a little, a little long, but it's worth it. And a lot of these terms with the next one, I'm including in the notes because I had to look them up too. So if you're like me, you probably didn't know anything about them, so it's cool. Uh, Pyotr Kratopkin was a Russian anarchist, socialist, revolutionary, economist, sociologist, historian, zoologist, political scientist, human geographer, activist, essayist, researcher, writer, and philosopher who advocated anarcho-communism. Most of those terms are going to be in the list later on. In March 1874, Kropotkin was arrested and imprisoned in the Peter and Paul Fortress for subversive political activity as a result of his work with the Circle of Tchaikovsky. A note will be down later. Because of his aristocratic background, however, he received special privileges in prison, such as, permis such as permission to continue his geographical work in his cell. In fact, he delivered his report on the subject of the Ice Age in 1876, where he argued that it had taken place in the in not as distant a past as he initial as he initially thought, 
or was as initially thought. This guy's just living his best life while in prison. Isn't that great? Love it. Uh, in, 18th, in June 1876, before his trial, he was moved to a low security prison in St. Petersburg, from which he escaped with the help of his friends. Now what I've got that doesn't have any details on the escape itself, just that he was helped up by his friends. Nothing after that. Or no more details, I mean. Uh, though on the no night of the escape, he and his friends celebrated by dining in one of the finest restaurants in St. Petersburg, assuming correctly that the police would not look for them there. How awesome is that? <laughs> for once, the uh, they'll never look for us here pays off. Okay? And it paid off in the best way. I love that. Uh, after this, he boarded a boat and headed to England, living there shortly before moving to Switzerland. Uh, in 1917, after the Re February Revolution, Kropotkin re returned to Russia after 40 years of exile. His, re his arrival was greeted by cheering crowds of tens of thousands of people. He was offered the Ministry of Education in the Provisional Government, which he promptly refused, feeling that working with them would be a violation of his anarchist principles. Eh, seems like a somewhat decent dude in that regard, I guess. Okay, next we've got uh, April 1881, Henry McCarty, under the pseudonym of William H. Bonney, better known as Billy the Kid, was tried for and convicted of the murder of Sheriff William J. Brady and was sentenced to hang in May of that year. He escaped from jail on April 28th, killing two sheriff's deputies in the process and evading capture for more than two months. Sheriff Pat Garrett, fuck that guy, shot and killed McCarty by the age of by then the age of 21 in Fort Sumner on July 14th, 1881. Um, now looking at that time, I'm trying to keep this under 20 minutes for everybody, just, you know, so it's not too long. Uh, I'm going to do one more. Alright. It is a bit longer like the other one, but it's also worth it. Um, Lum Yu. In 1894, Lum Yu approached the South Bend police chief, Marion Egbert, complaining that a fellow Chinese resident by the name of King had threatened him. Egbert brushed him off and suggested he, suggested he deal with the situation by himself. Yu took, the, took this advice, attacking King with an axe. For this, he, he was convicted of assault, was fined $500, $500, and was sentenced to a prison term of six months. Sure, I mean, that's it's 1894, so that, that tracks. In the summer of 1901, Yu was employed as a cannery worker and living in Bay Center. While playing cards on August 6th of that year, he was assaulted, threatened, and robbed by Oscar Bloom, a white man with a reputation as a bully. This time, Yu did not approach the, approach the police, but instead immediately took matters into his own hands. He went to his room, retrieved his gun, sought out, and shot Bloom in the abdomen, and then fled the scene. Bloom survived long enough to swear a deathbed affidavit, identifying Yu as the killer. Public sympathy, though, was pretty high for Yu after hearing what happened, but white employers of the Chinese workers pressed officials for action to be taken against him. Accordingly, Yu was arrested on August 7th and, in October 1901, was tried and convicted for the murder of Oscar Bloom. Contrary to the jurors' belief, though, that Yu... <laughs> Every time I say Yu, it, it sounds funny, and I know that. That's why I'm doing this one. Yu. Yu. That's my brain. I'm sorry. <laughs> Contrary to the jurors' belief, though, that you would receive a light sentence. The judge ordered that you be hanged, and the execution was scheduled for January 31st, 1902. Even after his conviction, you continued to enjoy public support. Petitions for clemency, one of which was signed by one of the jurors, were sent to the state governor. County officials sympathized with you, supposedly, supposedly leaving his cell door unlocked at night and encouraging him to escape. You eventually did escape early in the morning on January 14th. You hid, the, in, you hid in the environs of South Bend for several days, during which we, he was hunted by a squad led by Sheriff Thomas A. Roney. On January 17th, he was finally apprehended by a three-man posse, offering no resistance, and when he asked how he escaped, said that the door was open and he walked out. On January 27th, Governor Henry McBride rejected one of the petitions for clemency on procedural grounds. And on January 30th, confirmed by wire that he would not be not be he would not be commuting you sentence. 
and anticipation of the execution became so great that Roni was besieged but with request to attend. Roni issued 500 invitation cards. Some examples still survive. Use hanging proceeded as planned inside the courthouse of the county seat, South Bend, on the morning of January 30th, sorry, 31st, 1902. Uh, though it had, had been expected that he would break down, you ate fairly well that morning and went to the gallows without assistance. He bade his friends goodbye, then uttered his last words to his executioners, Kill me good. You was, first and only you was the first and only execution ever to take place in Pacific County. A month after his arrest, a new act of the Washington State Legislature took effect, which required execution for any future crimes to be carried out at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. And those are a few of the stories listed under the list of prison escapes. That's only up to 1901. They just get crazier after that, okay? Some even involve a freaking helicopter. And not more than one. I mean, not just one. Multiple people have escaped with helicopters. I can't wait to get into those, okay? Uh, again, if you like, give me five stars wherever you listen to this. Uh, email me at talkingwhateverwednesday at gmail.com. Uh, thanks for spending 20 minutes with me. And